Is there a way to discuss contentious issues of faith and morality without coming across as, I don't know, a uh, defensive Bible thumper, sounding like a nasty jerk, or just floundering hopelessly? Yes, there is. By the grace of God the Father, through the love and mercy of Jesus Christ, and through the wise use of the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. This will be an exploration of how that can happen. Maybe by the end, you'll have a deeper appreciation for Jesus' words about being wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Do you remember when maybe the toughest thing you thought was in evangelism was the time that you asked for the first time a neighbor to attend church with you? Or maybe it was trying to explain why you'd missed a family get together or your kid couldn't be at the soccer playoff game because it conflicted with worship. Do you remember the first time that you offered to pick up your friend and drive to the Bible study together? Or ask if you could pray with someone who was going through a, a tough time? Or maybe you just simply shared not only what you believe, but why you believe it. Generally, the worst rebuff you would get would be something like, thanks, no thanks. Oh, maybe your obnoxious cousin would make fun of you as a Bible-thumping fundagelical. Or someone would say, well, that may be your truth, but I'm all about, you know, real stuff, science and real data. Now, that may all sting, but generally most of us can shrug off those responses without, you know, going ballistic or cutting the other person out of our lives. In any case, all of those small and even tentative steps of discipleship, witness, and faithfulness are vitally important. So keep on doing them, one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of people are famished for the love of Jesus, whether they know it or not. Just walk with that one person at a time and lead them maybe one step closer to their dear Savior. But we need to face an unpleasant reality that makes such faithful witness harder and more discouraging, maybe even scary. What do I mean? Have you noticed how much nastier and more in your face some people are getting? More and more, they're not interested in conversation, dialogue, or explanations about a whole host of topics that go way beyond whether God exists or praying with someone is okay. These days, the um, walking through a minefield topics include abortion, gun control, critical race theory, gender ideology, and which energy sources limit climate change. Now, in one sense, this specific topic is not very important. It's the way in which some people engage with us. They don't simply respond or even react to something that we have said they immediately go on the offensive. They aren't interested in our explanations, clarification, or even our data. Even if they say, I follow the science, they often seem more driven by emotion than by rational discourse. They may say things that we know are not true or that are gross exaggerations, misrepresentations, or even redefinition of common terms. They cherry pick worst case examples to attack our belief. Sadly, some spew hateful, vulgar, and even obscene accusations and rejections. The mere fact that you are a Christian is enough to set them off on a tirade, even if you haven't explicitly referenced your faith. This can be like getting hit on the head with a board. I'm caught off guard. Ordinary defense of my belief, ordinary conversation seems impossible. Sometimes the other person is so full of hostility, contempt, and rage that our encounter goes way beyond even strenuous, deep disagreement. It's as if the other person is thinking, hey, you're not just wrong, you're evil. What you believe is evil. So what if I have a few little details wrong about the way in which you and your beliefs are evil lies? All you can do is give me a more exact picture of the ways in which you are evil. And I don't need to waste my time on that. 
Now, there may be times when it's wiser to walk away from encounters like that, especially in online forums like Twitter and other social media platforms. Platforms like Twitter can inflame and encourage so-called hot takes that react in unwise and <laughs> often unhinged fashion to what the other person is saying. It's best to hit delete, not send. Other times we simply may not be mentally, physically, or emotionally prepared to engage with the other person who is attacking our beliefs. We could be just tired or distracted or in a setting that makes further discussion difficult. Maybe our relationship with the other person raises red flags about continuing the conversation. It's probably not a good idea to get into it with a coworker, for example. And maybe we're just not well enough informed about either side of the issue to speak well to it in any detail. You know, sometimes it's okay to just say nothing. Someone once said, better to say nothing and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. You are wise occasionally to say, hey, I can see that this is something that you are passionate about. But right now, I'm not prepared to get into a discussion about it with you. Let's come back to it another time. And let's talk about something we can both agree on right now, shall we? But sometimes we want or need to respond in one of these walking through a minefield conversations. I'm not gonna tell you what to say in the heat of the moment. Instead, I'm gonna to try to walk you through and help you to prepare for these unwelcome, unexpected and challenging discussions or confrontations. First, as I wrote several months ago for an article in Lutheran Core, always lead with the love of Jesus. Be immersed in his love for you. Let his love overflow from your heart towards those he longs to draw closer to his side. Every day, and especially when somebody pushes my buttons, I need to remember that our Lord Jesus yearns for even the biggest pain in the neck to turn to him and to be saved. He died to forgive even the most outlandish and despicable sins. <laughs> and you know what? Sometimes I am that pain in the neck and despicable sinner. I need to repent, confess my waywardness, and beseech the Holy Spirit to rekindle the love of Jesus in my heart. You know, we all need to fall in love with our loving Savior again and again. As we do, Jesus' love will radiate through us to others. Think about St. Paul's words about love written to the Corinthian church. Love is patient and kind, he said. It rejoices in the right, not in the wrong. And remember what St. Peter said, always be ready to give an account of the hope that is in you, but do so with gentleness and reverence. In a very real sense, leading with the love of Jesus is a Christian secret weapon. The spirit whose fruits are love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, goodness, patience, faithfulness, and self-control also is the spirit who teaches us how to use those fruits as holy weapons that can pierce or soften the hardest heart. Just ask Peter about Jesus' loving and sorrowful gaze right after he had denied his Lord three times. This can be utterly alien and unexpected to those who confront us. They may never have encountered anyone who leads with the love of Jesus. Now, you may not always convince someone, but your love may challenge their pre preconceived notions about your beliefs or even about God. Who knows how and when the Holy Spirit could use that encounter as a patch of good soil in which the word might be sown, even if it apparently lies dormant for years. Many wise spiritual directors and mentors remind us that whenever we encounter falsehoods, lies, evil, sin, hate, injustice, and the like, 
we find ourselves on a battlefield. You see, we are not just disciples. We are soldiers, and this is spiritual warfare. And our basic training is lifelong. It includes prayer, scripture, worship, confession and absolution, reception of our Lord's body and blood, acts of selfless charity, and fasting. These are spiritual disciplines, and they're not designed to make us feel morally superior or spiritually virtuous, but they do draw us more deeply into the mystery of Jesus' passion and death for the salvation of sinners and into his glorious resurrection and ascension for their eternal life. Those things also teach us the spiritual muscle memory that every good soldier needs in order to properly wield the weapons of the spirit even in the heat of battle. And these disciplines remind us that we and the other person are both sinners. We both constantly need the mercy of God the Father given through the grace of Jesus Christ and activated by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the second thing you can do to prepare for these difficult encounters is to become deeply informed about a topic. If, for example, the topic is abortion, actually at least read a summary of the Dobbs decision and of the concurring and dissenting opinions. Go ahead and read statements from Planned Parenthood on matters concerning abortion. Familiarize yourself with arguments and worst-case scenarios that pro-abortion activists are making. They're not hard to find online. And then go to pro-life websites like the one for the March for Life. Or look up names like Catherine Jean Lopez. She's one of my favorite writers on all things Christian and pro-life or Abby Johnson, the former Planned Parenthood person who's become a fervently pro-life activist after seeing the sonogram of a fetus as it was about to be aborted. You know, you can even type pro-life and pro-choice arguments into your internet search engine. Well, if you see or hear a statement or accusation against Christians or other pro-life proponents, and it seems troubling, then do some digging. The hot take right now is that conservative pro-life Christians in particular are trying to criminalize women who have miscarriages or ectopic pregnancies and their doctors as well. And that in some states, women are being actively prevented from receiving this life-giving treatment. Now, this is absolutely and dangerously false, and it should be vigorously rebutted. Not one Christian denomination, pro-life organization, or state legislature has criminalized treatment for ectopic pregnancies or miscarriages. The only people spreading this horrid and life-threatening lie are people who demonize their pro-life and especially Christian enemies. It is vitally important that Christians who cherish all human life as a precious example of God's image, for whom the Son of God gave his own life, should combat these lies that can actually lead to the death of women. Now, the more you know about a contentious topic like this, the less threatened you'll feel if someone begins talking about it, even in strenuous opposition to your belief. Not only that, but you also might be able to transform a nasty argument into a more civil discussion. If you can accurately summarize the other person's position and address legitimate if inaccurate concerns, you can sometimes connect with that person. They can feel like they're being heard, respected, and understood. And that is disarming. It also dials down the temperature. The research and the reflection you do ahead of time 
can be part of your spiritual weapons training, using not only those previously mentioned fruits of the Spirit, but also his gifts of wisdom, understanding, and counsel. Now, these are all good and positive means of preparation for difficult conversations on divisive and contentious topics. What I'm going to talk about next may seem unpleasant and certainly unfamiliar, because we need to prepare by understanding a little of the methodology of argumentation, confrontation, and activism that's used by some of the most angry and anti-Christian people driving the discussion and the action against us. Now, if you aren't familiar with Saul Alinsky's book, Rules for Radicals, look it up. There are plenty of online summaries with explanations of his 13 rules. Alinsky was a community organizer in Chicago in the 60s. He had sown the seeds of class warfare with his community organizing. He got people to fight what he identified as power and privilege which supposedly were the root of all their problems. These rules train a weaker party to leverage power and public opinion against a purportedly stronger opponent. Now, some of Alinsky's rules seem to be ethically neutral, pragmatic, even David and Goliath strategies. They've been embraced, in fact, by nonviolent protesters, former presidents, and even pro-gay groups within Christian denominations. But make no mistake, Saul Alinsky was a communist sympathizer and virulently anti-Christian. <laughs> However facetiously, he dedicated this book to Lucifer. For him, morality and ethics were entirely in the service of the power to further one's cause. Now, many people that actually use his rules haven't actually studied Alinsky, but his perspective is baked into a lot of modern educational and political thought. It forms some of the basis for critical race theory, pro-abortion activism, various gender ideologies, and garden variety anti-Christian prejudice. Here are a few of his rules that I think are most important for us to ponder. I'll comment briefly on each of them in turn. Rule number one, power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. For Alinsky, everything is seen, understood, and acted upon through the lens of power. What a strange and terrible worldview this can be compared to seeing, understanding, and acting through the lens of the love of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Be aware of how utterly alien your lens of understanding is to other people. Rule number two, never go outside the experience of your people. The result is confusion, fear, and retreat. You know, many people that you're going to encounter in these difficult walking through the minefield conversations have astonishingly narrow perspectives. People who only read, discuss, and congregate with like-minded people exist in an ideological bubble. It makes them utterly convinced of their cause, but also utterly unknowledgeable about and unsympathetic toward anyone else's perspective, including yours. It also allows them to base their arguments on their lived experience of personal truths, often independent of an appeal to universal truth or even common life. Now, the flip side is this. As Christians, we are, of course, strengthened, nourished, and encouraged in our faith within a tight-knit community of believers. Nevertheless, people who lead with the love of Jesus are compelled to go outside their own faith bubble in order to genuinely reach out to other people. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, not just for us, but for everyone. 
And we need to do everything possible to equip ourselves to share him with even that difficult person sitting across the table from us. Rule number three, whenever possible, go outside the experience of the enemy. Here, you want to cause confusion, fear, and retreat. Yeah, that's how Saul Alinsky taught people to view others as enemies who must be confused, terrorized, and defeated. That is one reason that pregnancy resource centers aren't simply being vandalized or even firebombed, but now they're even being threatened by machete-wielding individuals hell-bent on terrorizing people and shuttering these facilities. Many of them have never needed armed security guards until now. Those working in or visiting these places that only exist to help support pregnant women and their babies, born as well as unborn, are now always looking over their shoulders. That is utterly foreign to their experience or their instincts. Now, are there difficult situations and real battles in the world where keeping the enemy off balance and confusing and causing them to retreat is an excellent tactic? Undoubtedly. But the person on the other side of the abortion issue is not such an enemy. A woman exercising her right to choose by choosing life for her unborn child is not such an enemy. Those who insist on thinking and acting within their own belief bubble, however, are often tempted and even encouraged to label the other as exactly that, the enemy. This is one reason I urge you to become as informed as possible on all sides of an issue. Learn and understand the person and the perspective that stands in opposition to your beliefs or attacks your faith. At the very least, you're not going to be as confused, fearful, or retreat prone. And you will be more likely to treat that person as a fellow sinner in need of God's truth, strength, forgiveness, and mercy, instead of treating them as if they were an enemy. Rule number four, make the enemy live up to their own book of rules. You can kill them with this, for they can no more obey their own rules than the Christian church can live up to Christianity. You know, this, this is why self-reflection, repentance, and humility are absolutely critical weapons of the spirit because they blunt this weapon of criticism and shaming. Those who already admit that they are sinners saved by the grace of God alone and whose only boast is in the worthiness of Christ. Oh, they're going to be unruffled by the accusations even of the great accuser himself, much less the accusations of any who have been deceived by him. Rule number five, ridicule is man's most potent weapon. It's hard to counteract ridicule and it infuriates the opposition, which then reacts to your advantage. This indeed is a bitter weapon to use against anyone. Don't use it in retaliation. It's not a weapon of the spirit, so be very, very cautious about picking it up. Also, if your faith, your belief, your stance on a public issue, even your savior is being ridiculed belittled, or shamed by someone, try to do three things. First, be silent and pray for patient wisdom. <laughs> that may take a while. Second, if you can, say as gently and sympathetically as you can muster, I am so sorry that the only argument you can come up with is to insult me or God. Third, gently but firmly, stipulate that if the other person rid it persists in ridiculing, shaming, or insulting speech, then the conversation is ended. 
and then act on it as necessary. Walk away. Rule number eight, keep the pressure on. It is this that will cause the opposition to react according to your advantage. Again, this is a power play. This is the technique used by protesters who are demonstrating in front of Supreme Court justices' residences. And it's also used by telemarketers and toddlers having a meltdown in the checkout lane of the grocery store. It's annoying, it's exhausting, and it's often effective. Sometimes just being aware of this rule can strengthen you against the worst of its effects. However, you may need to set very clear boundaries and be prepared to enforce them. Settle in your mind ahead of time what are the limits of your patience, time, and willingness to engage with a person who is pressuring or even threatening you with their arguments. As in the last rule I discussed, be ready, willing, and able to announce those boundaries and to walk away. Being a Christian does not mean being a doormat or a patsy. And finally, point number 13, rule number 13 is pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Don't try to attack abstract co corporations or bureaucracies. Instead, identify a responsible individual. Ignore attempts to shift or spread blame. The main job of the organizer is to bait an opponent into reacting. The enemy, properly goaded and guided in his reaction, will be your major strength. I think this is probably the most alien concept for Christians to comprehend. We rightly bemoan polarization or the gotcha mentality of so many of the people that we hear or speak with. As I said, they often seem to have no interest in rational discussion, clarification, or bridge building. We think of that as a besetting flaw, something to be repented of and to be overcome. Sadly, for those marinated in Alinsky's rules, this polarizing contempt, these ad hominem attacks are not bugs, but features of the system. They're designed to rock you back on your heels, to put you on the defensive, and to distract you from either articulating your own position or effectively rebutting the other person's position. The point is to make you appear weak, ineffective, foolish, and defensive. Well, just because you know that that's happening doesn't always mean you can counteract it. But you can remind yourself, even in the most disconcerting and exasperating encounter with another person, that the point of that encounter is not to win the argument even to convince the other person, certainly not to shame them and not to amass power for yourself or even success for your cause. It is to glorify the crucified and risen Lord Jesus in all your words, your actions, your demeanor, and even in your willingness to suffer shame and contempt for his sake. Your sole purpose on earth is to love, obey, and share Jesus. Everything else I've said is utterly secondary to that purpose. What does it matter that our side wins this or that court battle, elects this or that candidate, defeats or promotes this or that legislation or program, if in the process we lose our own souls by demonizing our opponents and taking up the devilish weapons of Saul Alinsky and his fellow travelers. It's said that the most important way that we can confront someone who believes, says, or does something contrary to the will and the word of God is to speak the truth in love. And that's what this has all been about today. And so arm yourself with the truth and with all the information you can comprehend and digest. Train yourself to recognize the, the weapons and the, the techniques that are being used against you. Train yourself in all the disciplines needed to wield the mighty weapons of the Holy Spirit. 
but most of all, recognize that in the end, it is the cross of Jesus Christ on which was hung the salvation of the whole world that wins the victory. He has won the victory for us, for those who seem most opposed to his will, and for the world that he died for and that we, both we and our opponent, claim to love. My dear friends, no matter the issue, no matter the opposition, no matter the attacks we endure or shame we bear, always, always lead with the love of Jesus. It's all we really have. And thanks be to God, it is all that we and anyone else shall ever need. To him alone be the glory. Thank you.